Hey, thanks for joining us today. Here in our channel, you can catch all of our messages and live services. And our hope is that you would experience the presence of God in a very real and tangible way. That's right. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message again, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button below this video. I'm excited because, you know, um, what I want to talk about today is, is something that's very near and dear to my heart. In fact, you know, when I think back about uh, m many years ago when Joel and I were dreaming about this church, you know, like the, the, the whole napkin dream when we're sitting in a, a Starbucks and we're like brainstorming, like what is Crossroads going to be like? You know, like what, what do we want it to feel like? What do we want it to look like? A lot of what we're going to talk about today and really in this series is some of those things that, that we dreamed about many years ago. Uh, we're in the middle of a series called God Created Us for What? fun. God created us for fun. And last week, Pastor Joel kind of laid this theological groundwork of, of the fact that we are wired by our creator to enjoy life. In fact, Jesus even said that that's why he came to the earth. He came, he says in John 10, 10, he came to give us a rich and satisfying life. And a lot of times Christians, you know, uh, I wouldn't say as many American Christians. I've been or all around the world, a lot of uh, a lot of different places, um, and maybe some of you here today kind of take on this mentality of because I'm a Christian that that life is going to be hard. It's full of rules. I need to keep my head down and and keep working hard. And the truth is, yes, I mean we do suffer. That's a that is an absolute. I mean you can't get out of suffering. And yes. The kingdom, the work of the kingdom is a lot of hard work, but we were wired to enjoy life. Jesus came so that we can have a rich and satisfying life. And so that's what we want to talk about over these, these uh, few weeks as we talk about how God created us for fun. Now let's play a quick game. I want you to take a moment and I want you to think back through your childhood um, through your the, your teen years, your high school years, we, let's just skip over middle school because we know those were the the hardest years, like right, <laughs> the most awkward, weird years. Um, but 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 you know your your elementary years, your your high school years, your your college years. Think back over this. I want I want you to just kind of remember some fun memories. Think about like some of the times that you could say, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I know for me, you know, I think about riding bikes with my friends around our neighborhood. Like, that's what kids of the 80s did. <laughs> we, like, got home, dropped off our backpack, and at, we're out the door getting on our bikes. Mom is, like, yelling out as we're, like, leaving the house, like, be back by dark. You know, like, like that. that's just what we did is in the 80s. And um, so that's one of the things I think about. I think about playing Super Mario Brothers with my siblings and beating Super Mario. I was the first one in the family to beat Super Mario Brothers. Um, I think about camping with my family. We are a family of six on a single income. My dad was a teacher, so we never got to, we never stayed in hotels or flew away. To, we like always went camping. That was our, our family vacation, and it was so much fun. We loved camping as a family. I remember uh, being a teenager in the youth group and another thing we did in the 80s, which I don't really hear about anymore, but we used to do these things called lock-ins. Yes, okay, all my church kids are out there. I mean, like now I'm just thinking like, oh gosh, well, like what a mess. But what they would do is they would bring all the youth group into the church building, lock the doors, and let them go crazy like Lord of the Flies for like 12 hours. It was pretty crazy. Lots of pizza, lots of soda, lots of candy. Uh, we would play like Ghost in the Graveyard and like all kinds of like flashlight tag. Lots of fun. Um, uh, for me, like it was really fun in high school. I was, uh, you know, like cheering on a, on a Friday night football game. Like that was so much fun. I loved, loved that. Um, I uh, just thinking... Um, I loved country line dancing. When I was in high school, like we went to the, like uh, up in Northern Virginia, my school was very well known as Cow Pie High. It was like right in the middle of a cow field and you'd walk to school in the morning and like it smelled like cow manure, all that stuff. But like, I, I just remember in high school, like something that we do for fun is we'd go to like the local Elks Club, <laughs> you know, like one of those clubs and we go country line dancing. That was 
a lot of fun. I loved water skiing. My aunt, my uncle, my aunt and uncle owned a, a water boat. And so like up in, in New York, we'd go up to the Finger Lakes and we'd water ski all summer long. So many good memories. So as you're thinking through your own fun memories of your childhood, of your, your adolescence, your teen years, I want you to think through, like just, just visualize some of those memories. And I want you to ask yourself, Am I alone in any of those memories? Am I alone in any of those memories? My guess is that for most, if not all, of those fun memories that you're thinking about right now, I'm guessing that most, if not all, include people. See, fun is always associated with other people, enjoying life with other human beings, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, whether you're shy or outgoing, whether you, uh, you know, just love to be in big crowds or you'd rather be in a small group. One of the, the, uh, every single one of us, one of our absolute greatest needs is to belong, is to be loved. In fact, if you guys remember from psychology class, does anyone remember this uh, diagram? This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So like, the most basic things we need are air, water, food, shelter, all of that stuff. We, uh, more, we also need personal security. We need to feel safe. Those are like our, our like bottom line needs. What is right above like the bottom line needs? It's love and belonging. We need to, to be a part of, of, of a group of people. We need to know that, that we're accepted, that we're loved, that, that people have our backs, that, that they are going to, uh, you know, protect us and, and love us and care for us. Right after the very basic needs in priority is to belong, is to be loved. And this is our human nature. This is the way that God wired us. We need to belong. We need to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. We were designed by our creator to enjoy life and have fun with other human beings. And, and um, as you walk down this memory lane, it, it should confirm that statement, that, that need that you have to love and belong. All of your good memories, I'm thinking most of them, if not all, have to do with enjoying life with other people. One of the things that I love about this church, about Crossroads, is, is this idea of, of belonging. You know, we have it pasted on our wall. When you walk in, welcome home. Like, welcome to the family. You're here with us. We, are, we just love to, to build relationships and, and, and grow together in the love of Jesus. That's really who we are as a church. That's what we dreamed about. As, as young, you know, church planners, we dreamed of a place where people could come and belong and do life with each other and, and, and learn to, to enjoy life with each other. That's who we are as a church. I love that. Have you ever um, been in a, con like maybe you're talking to your neighbor, you're hanging out with, with friends, coworkers, family, and, and just as they're talking, you, you have like this thought like, man, I think they would really like our church. Like, man, I wish that, that they could come and see what Crossroads is like. I know I have conversations like that all the time. But see, the thing is, it really has nothing to do with the place of Crossroads Church. Like, it has nothing to do with this building. We're not thinking, like, man, I want my friend to come and sit, like, to, to feel the comfort of one of those auditorium chairs. Like, that's not what we're thinking. We're not thinking, like, oh, they're going to love the 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 you know, the lobby. The lobby is so cool. It's nice and open, and, and there's free coffee. I mean, that is that is actually something that they might really like. But we're not thinking about the actual building when we're thinking about inviting our friends and family. We're thinking about the experience that we've had in the presence of God and with his people. Amen? That's, w that's where it's at. It no has nothing to do with the actual building or, or the facility in which we're meeting. It has everything to do with the people involved. The, the actual biblical meaning of the word church, when you read in the New Testament, throughout the New Testament, whenever the word church is used, um, the word is not, because we do, like as American, in our American English, we think, when we hear the word church, we think a place. But the actual word is ecclesia. 
And ecclesia, the, the, the literal meaning of this word church, ecclesia is a gathering of people for a purpose. It actually, like, anytime you, like, do, like, a little study, read through the New Testament, whenever you see the word church, it's not talking about a meeting location. It's talking about a group of people who are meeting together for a purpose. And, and, and so when, when you're telling your friends, hey, I want you to come to my church, you're not inviting them to this building. You're inviting them to the people. Church is not a place Church is the people. So what is the purpose? I mean, if ecclesia, you know, the church gathered, there's a purpose. What is the purpose of our gathering? Is the purpose of our gathering to, like, you know, get some goosebumps during worship? Is the purpose of our gathering, like, the free child care? (laughs) Is Is the purpose of our gathering that we have, like, great coffee, free, you can have as much as you want? Is the purpose of our gathering to be spiritually fed by our pastor? What is the purpose of our gathering? See, Jesus seemed to think that it was for none of those reasons that I just mentioned. You may benefit from those things. You may get something out of the free coffee. I know a lot of us walked in tired today and we made a beeline for that coffee line. And, and you may get benefit from, from your kids, you know, having a little separation from your kids for, for an hour <laughs> on a Sunday morning. That'd be a nice benefit. But that's not the reason why we're here. That's not the purpose. Because all of those things that I just mentioned is all about me. It's all about you. And the truth of the matter is, in the words of Rick Warren, it's not about you. The purpose of our gathering is not about me. It's not about you. We do not gather together to to fill your needs. I'm sorry to break it to you. (laughs) That's not why we're here. The reason why we're here, Jesus taught, is all about the people. And not just the people. The the gathering of the people is, is not just for those that are here. It's for those that are not here yet. You know, I'm looking at this room right now, and I can see quite a few empty chairs. You know what is going through my mind? There's people that should be in these empty seats. There's people that aren't here today. There's, there's, there's dudes out mowing their lawns right now, and they should be here. There's moms that are like, you know, like going crazy, getting their kids breakfast, and they should be here. There, there are kids that 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 don't have a family who who is, loves them, they should be here. I think about that all the time. Who is missing? Who's not here? And in Luke 15, Jesus tells three different stories, three different parables um, to describe what the kingdom of God is like. This is the way Jesus would teach often is he would kind of give you this allegorical story and then he would explain to his disciples what he meant behind the story. And so in Luke 15, he gives three different stories to talk about what the kingdom of God is like. Now, in these three stories, he is telling the same story three different ways. And if you go, and I would encourage you to take some time this week to go back and read all of Luke 15, because you'll see the, the three stories. Is The first one is the lost sheep. You know, you, you may... Recollect, there's a story about a shepherd who loses one sheep and he leaves the 99 to go and find the one. And when he finds the one, they all rejoice because the one that was lost was found. And then the next second story is about a woman who lost a coin. And she tore her heart. She had 10 coins, but she was missing one. She tore the house apart looking for this coin. She was frantically, like, looking for this coin. And when she found it, she ran out into the street, and she's like, I found my coin. She was so excited, and everyone rejoiced with her. The third story is about the lost son. Do you see already I've told you about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. What's the common common denominator? Lost. Jesus is telling us the purpose of our gathering is for those who are lost. And and I also want to mention, just as as you dig into the Bible, anytime, anything, whether it's Jesus talking, Paul, 
someone in the Old Testament, anytime something is repeated, like one right after the other, this is like really important. It's just an ancient way of writing. So if they repeat themselves, this is like as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we should be leaning in. Like this is really, really important. So three times in a row, consecutively, Jesus tells the story about something of value that was lost, and when it is found, the great rejoicing, the party that comes afterwards. And so this really is, we're going to, we're going to, dive into this third story today, the lost son. And um, what, I, what I hope that you'll uh, hear as we kind of dig in and dive into this, this story is that, that what is lost is of utmost importance. What is lost is of great value. It is so important to Jesus. And when what is lost is found, there is always rejoicing, celebration, a party. That is the purpose of why we gather. So let's read together in Luke chapter 15. We'll start with verse 11. I apologize. It's going to be a long uh, passage, but it'll be worth it. So again, Jesus starts, it says, to, to illustrate the point further. So remember, this is the third time he's telling the same story a different way. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. Everybody say distant. Distant land. And there he wasted. Everybody say wasted. All of his money in wild living. About the, t about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned to home to his father, and while he was a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran out to meet his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But, the fa but his father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger. Just so you know, the ring, like in ancient times, that was a signet ring. Like this, he is welcoming him back into his family, again saying, you now have everything that I have. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must, what? Celebrate with a feast. There's going to be some good eating. A big old potluck is going to happen. For this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost and now he is found. So the party began. Let's get it started. Yeah, like, no, that, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help myself. The party began. Now, Jesus is such an incredible storyteller. A good storyteller knows how to bring the listener in to where you are imagining yourself in the story. And as I read this story, I can so relate to this son. I can imagine myself in his shoes. I can imagine be like the, all the feelings that he must have felt. The, the shame and the anxiety and, and everything that came with going his own way and failing miserably. Just for, for a moment, just think about where he was 
mentally, where, where his emotions must have been, his, even physically, he was, he was, it says he was dying of hunger. He was so hungry that the food that the pigs were eating looked good to him. So he is in this utter state of like, like the bottom of the bottom, the lowest of the lows. He was at the end of his rope, the bottom of a very deep pit that he had dug for himself. He was overwhelmed. He was dying from the inside out because of the choices that he made. And very rightly so, he is riddled with anxiety. He, he is feeling this anxiety over returning. And so he rehearses what he's going to say to his father. And I can only imagine, I mean, the story says that he went off to a distant land. He's so far away. Imagine that long, long, long journey home. And the entire time he's rehearsing what he's going to say. Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. He's saying it over and over, rehearsing it. Please take me on as a hired servant. I don't deserve to be your son. I don't deserve to have you back as a father, but at least could I just be your servant? The long road, not knowing what, how he would be received. He was so fully aware of what he had done. He was so fully aware of his failure. He was so fully aware of his mistakes. And, you know, a lot of times Christians think when, when someone is returning or they're kind of coming back or, or they're at, in a place of repentance that we have to tell them, like, what they've done wrong. We have to, like, you know, r- list out, like, how, they, how the, the, the wrong way that they went. But I can almost assure you, and I only know this because of times of my life where I've been the lost son. I said, I don't need anyone to tell me <laughs> what I've done. I, I've already told myself a million times over. And this lost son, he, he is overwhelmed. He's, he's anxious. He's rehearsing what he's going to say to his dad. He's coming from a f- long way away. And I just want to tell you today that no matter what you've done, how many times you've done it, how many times you've failed, how many times you've struggled, how many times you've gone back to what you know was not good for you, no matter how much fear and anxiety you have at the thought of coming back to God, of coming back to church, you may have been dragged here today. Someone like brought you here and you came kicking and screaming. You didn't want to be here. I just want you to know that no matter how far from God that you are, The Father wants to see every single one of us as children who need to come home. No matter where you're at, whether you've been kind of, you know, floundering in your faith, doubting, whether you have turned and gone your own way despite people saying, no, don't go that way. No matter where you're at, the truth is the Father wants to see you as a child who needs to come home. You know, every single one of us is a rebel. Every single one of us was born a sinner. Every single one of us chases after things that don't matter. We all give ourselves over to addictions and relationships that are destructive. We choose to trust in the bottle or the pills or the sex keeping busy at work. We trust in other things instead of trusting in the only one who can save us from ourselves. Every single one of us. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. So don't ever for one moment think that when you look at a pastor on stage that we have no sin. Listen, I'm reading this before you today. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all chosen our own path, strayed away from God's path, and taken our own. I am the lost son. You are the lost son. We are the lost son. So 
But by the grace of God, we have a father who anxiously awaits our return. He anxiously waits for us to come to our senses like the lost son did. He's not going to beat us into submission. He, he's not going to run at, after us and like lecture us and, and tell us what we've done wrong. No, he's going to let us go our own way, but he's going to anxiously wait and watch and hope and pray that we return to him. For those of you who don't yet identify as a Christian, you do not claim Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. For those of you who have walked away and have been far from God for a long time, you may be so far from God and a long way off, but I can sure assure you this, it's that the Father longs for your return. Jesus longs for your return. He longs for it. He's waiting. He's hoping. He anticipates us coming home. You know, Joel and I, um, we have two older teenagers and, um, and a nine-year-old, so we won't be empty nesting for at least nine more years. <laughs> but I, I don't know what empty nesting is like. I know some of you have experienced that, and it's such a crazy transition. I can't even imagine. I do know for me, when any one of my kids is gone for even just 24 hours, whether they are like across the street at a friend's house, a uh, sleepover, or, or you know, they've, they've gone on, like Hannah's gone on missions trips and stuff like that. Like when one of my kids is away, it feels like, like a piece of my heart is gone. <laughs> it feels like the house just got super quiet. It feels like this, er, there's a void and an emptiness when just one of them is gone. When, I, when one of them is gone, I don't think like, oh, I'm, I, at least I have my two kids. <laughs> at least I got them. No, I miss, I long for the return of the one that's not with us. And in this story, we're looking at a father who has, his son is lost. He doesn't even know where his son is. He doesn't know if his son is safe. He doesn't know if his son is thriving. He has no idea what's going on in the life of his son. And I can only imagine the longing and the heartache and the, the, the desire to see the face of his son again. He didn't know when or even if. He would ever see his child again, but he continued to watch and wait. And it says in verse 20, yeah, verse 20, that while the son was, a sti was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. The father saw his son while he was still a long way off. Do you know what this means? It means that he was watching. It means that he was waiting. He wouldn't have been able to see his son a long way off unless he was on that front porch watching the road. The father was watching and waiting. He never stopped praying for his son. He never stopped watching and waiting. He watched and he waited. He watched and he waited. He watched and he waited. He watched and he waited until finally his son appeared off, far off in the distance. And, and when, when, he, when he went out to meet his son, notice that he didn't wait for the son to get to him. That, that's a big piece right there. Notice that he didn't wait for the son to close in that far off distance and come to him so that he could beg for forgiveness. No, the father ran out to meet him right where he was at. And right where he was at was a long way off. Do you see where I'm going with this? The father, as long as he knows that you are drawing near to him, he will draw near to you. And maybe you're still a long way off today. Maybe you've been floundering and you've been wandering and you've been trying out new things. But today, maybe you're starting to come to your senses and you've begun walking towards the Father again. And I want you to hear me today is that the Father has been watching and waiting for your return. 
He's been watching and waiting for you. And if you'll just take a step closer to him today, he will come running to you. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And if all you have is a little baby step or a little crawl, whatever that looks like, you start walking towards him, and he will come near to you. Now, the son, as the father meets him, the son is not only met with love and compassion and hugs and kisses. I'm sure those were some major sloppy wet kisses. <laughs> I mean, I bet it was just like, okay, dad, okay. So he's not just met with love and compassion. When the son confesses his sin to the father, the father doesn't say it's about time. The father doesn't like list off all these requirements of what it's going to take to be in right standing with him. The father doesn't say you broke this rule and this rule and this rule and this rule and you should have done this and you shouldn't. No, none of that. He, he embraced him. He kissed him. And then he said, quick, bring the finest robe in the house. Put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now is returned to life. He was lost, but now he has been found. So the party began. And there's something here that's really easy to miss. That's the fact that he said, quick. Let's party quick. Now, I was an event planner for many, many years. I've done weddings. I have done corporate events, I have done big retreats, I have done banquets, I have done like, like huge events. And I'm just telling you, a big party is not something that you can just say, quick, let's have the party. In most cases, it takes almost a year, if not longer than a year, to plan for that big event. Like the, the, the corporate events that I would do, we started planning like two years in advance. You know, you got to secure the hotel and you got to get all the catering and you got all the stuff. Like, you have to plan far in advance. The fact that the father said, Quick, start the party. You know what that means? It means that the party had always been ready. The party was waiting, the party was ready to go. They had been fattening up that calf, they're like getting some meat on those bones. They're going to have a big old pit barbecue. It's going to be good. They had been preparing. The father had been waiting and watching and preparing for the return of his son. It was waiting to happen. And so the party could, could happen the moment his son returned. It began right away, the feasting and dancing and fun. The party began. And this is the party that happens when lost people find Jesus. This is the party that is supposed to be happening. This is what church is supposed to be like. Church, when we gather together, when we come together, it's not supposed to be this big sob story all the time. Like, woe is me, life is hard. No, when we get together and lost people are returning to Jesus, it's supposed to be a party. It's supposed to be fun, celebratory. And the party began, and, and there's one person in the story that we haven't met yet. The party gets started. The music is playing. People are eating. They're dancing on the dance floor. It is just a big old fun time. But there's one guy we haven't met because he is outside sulking, literally. He's outside of the party, and he's pouting. He's sulking. This is the good son. This is the son, you know, at the beginning of the story, Jesus says a father had two sons, and then the whole story is about this disobedient, wayward son that leaves and squanders all his father's wealth. We know all about him, but there's still the other son. So while this other, while the, while the, the lost son is like, like making a mess of his life, the other son has been faithful to his father. He has stood by his side he is, it actually says that, that he's out, like when the party started, he was out walk. he didn't even know his brother had returned. He had been out work, working the fields, taking care of his father's, father's resources. 
He's doing the stuff. Like he's he's working for God. He's working for the Father. He, he's, he's doing, he's all about the Father's business. He's out t- tending the fields. And then he hears the party. He's like, what is going on? What? Like he hears it from the fields. And he comes out, a servant's like, oh, yeah, your brother's home. And we're celebrating. He's home. Come on in. The party's awesome. And the, and the son didn't come in. He was like, no, thank you. And so we'll pick up here. It says the older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him to come in, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? And his father said to him, look, son, dear son, you have always stayed by me. And everything that I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life he was lost but now he's found see the other son is upset because his consistent obedience has never been celebrated as much as the return of his disobedient brother and the son wants to pout but the father wants to party Their hearts in this moment are in two completely different places. The obedient son, the one who proudly bore the name of his father, who obediently stayed by his side, who worked hard for him and tended to his fields, is now misaligned and off track of the will of his father. Why? Because in that moment, it was all about him. It was all about what he deserved. It was all about what he needed. And sometimes we, the church, us church people, we can be a lot like that good son. We think that the party should be for us. We walk out on a Sunday morning thinking about all the, re- the ways that, that church didn't suit our needs. Whether it's nobody talk to me. <laughs> Whether it's no one, like, they, I, fe- I feel like I couldn't connect to anybody. Or, man, that sermon was a little off today. Or, man, it was so loud, though. The worship was way too loud. Or whatever it is, my kid had a ball taken from them. And we walk out of church, and, and we kind of feel like this, like, hey, what about me? Right? We have this, this idea like that, that church is actually the gathering of, of God's people coming together with a purpose that we, we not necessarily in our minds think that it's about us, but that's actually what we actually act like sometimes. And I'm not like pointing a finger, trust me. <laughs> there are many moments that I leave on a Sunday and all I can think about is, is me, really. But the truth is, when we think that the party should be for us, what we don't realize is that the Father all along is inviting us in to the party. He's inviting us in. He wants us. He's saying, listen, everything I have is yours. Anything that you need is yours. You have it freely. I want you to come in and join the party. This party is, yes, we're celebrating the return of my lost son. But the fattened calf, it's not just for him, it's for everybody. The fattened calf, it's for you, it's for me, it's for us. And the last thing that I have to end with, number three, is that the father wants us to join the party. He wants us to be a part of the rejoicing, of the celebration. If we truly follow Jesus and share his heart, then we have to join him on his mission. We have to come and be a part of why he came. His mission was to find those who are lost and bring them home. He even said in in Luke 
19.10, he said, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. That's why Jesus came. He came to seek and save those who are lost. And he is inviting us to be a part of that mission. And when the mission is accomplished, there is much rejoicing and celebration and fun. So if you're not having fun at church, well, I want to invite you to come to the party. I want to invite you to come to the party. Rejoice when those who are lost are found. How about you? How about us? Do we have the same heart of the Father, of Jesus, for those who are not here yet? Do you look at these empty seats and imagine which neighbor is missing, which coworker, which friend, which, which family member needs good news, which family member needs to, to, to have that experience of being in relationship with Jesus people? Like, like when you walk in, are you thinking more about what you're going to get out of, of your experience in the gathering? Or are you thinking about who needs to come to the party? Who needs to be here? Do we focus on reaching the people who aren't here yet? Or do we focus on pleasing the people who already are? See, with Jesus, there will always be a party when the lost return home. The Bible says that when one soul returns home, that all of heaven rejoices. Are we going to join in that rejoicing? Are we going to be a part of that celebration? Or are we going to sit out in the field and sulk and be sad because the party wasn't about us? <laughs> Jesus is saying, come on in. Be a part of the party. Rejoice with me. The lost are returning. So I want to encourage you. We're going to sing and we're going to pray in just a moment. But I want to encourage you today. Next Sunday, we're having a big old party. I mean, we are going to, it's we, literally our service is going to be like 20 minutes long. And then the rest of our time together is party time. We are going to have so much fun. All of us are going to have fun together. And I want to encourage you to bring your friends. It's not just for you. The party is not just for you. Bring your friends. Bring your family. Bring people you think would never step foot in a church. And let them see how the people of God like to have fun together. Amen? Amen. Will you guys stand with me? We're going to worship. But before we do, I want to ask that you would just enter into a posture of prayer. Welcome the Holy Spirit. God, we just welcome you into this moment. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for this word that you're speaking to us today, God. If you relate to that older, good, obedient child, I know for me there have been moments where I have been so angry with God and I you know I, I kind of spit out this this angry prayer like God I've done everything you asked me to do why are things still crappy like I have been obedient I have followed your ways why are things not going the right way for me and what I would encourage you if you're in that place today Jesus is saying would you just open your eyes Open your eyes outside of you, outside of your situation, and I want you to see that the lost are returning home. That people who are lost are being found. People who are gone are coming back to me. Would you just open your eyes and see that? I want you to come into the party. I want you to celebrate their return. But I also want to speak to anyone who is still a long way off. Anyone who is maybe not even yet coming to your senses, you're just kind of like there, there's, there's a, a, a turning inside of you that an understanding that, that there is a distance between you and Almighty God, you and the Savior of the world. 
And I just want to say that even if you are a long way off, the Father sees you. He knows you. He knows what's going on. He knows about your situation. He knows about your pain. He knows about your questions. He knows everything. He sees you even if you're a long way off. And if you today will just take one step towards him, he's going to come running to meet you. He wants to be with you. He wants you to know him. And he wants to receive you with compassion and mercy and grace. He longs for you to take that step. So with every eye closed, if that's you today, and you've been far from God and you know that you were distant, would you just slip up your hand and say, Jesus, I'm going to take one step closer to you today. May not be the whole way. Thank you for that hand. Anywhere, Anyone else? May not be all the way home, but I'm just going to take that one step. Thank you for that hand. I'm just going to take an, uh, the, the, the one step closer, Jesus. Would you come and meet me where I'm at? Would you come to me today? If that's you, I'm going to pray a prayer, and you can formulate your own words. Just say, Jesus, I'm coming. I'm going to take a step towards you. Would you meet me today? I know I acknowledge that you see me, my pain, my questions, my hurt, my doubt, my fear, my anxiety. Jesus, I'm, I'm far but I'm going to take a step towards you. Would you draw near to me? And some of you are ready to come home. Some of you are ready to give your life over and submit your life to Jesus. And I just invite you to pray that prayer. You don't need me to lead you to just say, Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. You are my King. I'm going to follow you from this day forward. No turning back. I have decided to follow you. Pray that prayer right now.